Are colleges across America rife with racism, sexism, and homophobia? If you answer, no, that's absurd, you probably have a fair amount of common sense. If you answer, yes, you are probably a college administrator. Wait, you might ask, college administrators accuse their own schools of being racist, sexist, and homophobic? How does that make any sense? To understand how a college administrator thinks, you must first, as the popular saying goes, follow the money. If you do, you will not only discover why college administrators declare their own colleges racist, sexist, and homophobic, but also why, if you're a student, your tuition keeps going up, and why, if you're a parent, your bank balance keeps going down. Here's how it works. If colleges are racist, sexist, and homophobic, the only way to change that, if you're a college administrator, is to create a massive diversity bureaucracy. And that, of course, is massively expensive. No institution provides a more vivid example than the University of California, a once great university system which is self-destructing in the name of diversity. The diversity ideology has encroached upon every aspect of the University of California's collective psyche and mission. It is the one constant in every university endeavor. It impinges on hiring, distorts the curriculum, and sucks up vast amounts of faculty time and taxpayer money. Even the university's ongoing budget problems have not touched it. Since 2010, UC San Francisco, UC San Diego, and UCLA have all created new vice chancellorships in diversity, equity, and inclusion, with salaries starting at a quarter million dollars a year or higher. Each of these new posts is wildly redundant. Yet each new diversity position inevitably generates an even greater surge of junior bureaucrats, all sucking in tuition dollars. In 2011, UC Berkeley's Vice Chancellor for Equity and Inclusion presided over a staff of 17. Yet just one year later, his staff had ballooned to 24. No wonder the number of administrators at the University of California almost equals that of the faculty. Here's an only partial list of the diversity bureaucracy at UC San Diego. The Associate Vice Chancellor for Faculty Equity the Assistant Vice Chancellor for Diversity, the Staff Diversity Liaison, the Undergraduate Student Diversity Liaison, the Graduate Student Diversity Liaison, the Chief Diversity Officer, the Director of Development for Diversity Initiatives, the Director of the Cross-Cultural Center, the Director of the Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender Resource Center, the Director of the Women's Center, these diversity bureaucrats place nonstop pressure on departments to hire on the basis of race, gender, and sexual preference. Their trick is to set the hiring bar low enough to scoop in more female and minority candidates, and then declare that anyone above that bar is qualified enough to trump the most qualified candidate when that candidate is a white or Asian male. But sometimes even that evisceration of standards isn't enough. In that case, the administration simply creates a new hiring category. In September 2012, after UC San Diego's electrical and computer engineering faculty refused to hire a mediocre female professor whom the administration had tried to force on them, the engineering school announced that it would be creating a, quote, excellence position the school's Orwellian phrase for women and minorities who cannot get hired even after hiring standards have been lowered. Remember, these machinations are all in the service of a problem that doesn't exist. It's entirely fabricated. UC's campuses, like colleges throughout America, are easily the most welcoming and inclusive social environments in human history, at least if you're not a conservative. Female and minority students are surrounded by caring adults who are dedicated to their academic success. They enjoy opportunities for learning and self-development that are the envy of the world. As for the faculty, the idea that 
any academic department would reject the most qualified candidate simply because that candidate was black, Hispanic, female, or gay is absurd. Not to mention an entirely gratuitous insult to every faculty member on the hiring committees. Universities should be the institution in society that is the most dedicated to reason and evidence-based decisions. But with their crusade against their own make-believe racism and sexism, UC and almost every other American university betray that ideal every day. I'm Heather McDonald of the Manhattan Institute for Prager University. You may not realize it, but you are currently funding some dangerous people. They are indoctrinating young minds throughout the West with their resentment-ridden ideology. They have made it their life's mission to undermine Western civilization itself, which they regard as corrupt, oppressive, and patriarchal. If you're a taxpayer or paying for your kid's liberal arts degree, you're underwriting this gang of nihilists. You're supporting ideologues who claim that all truth is subjective, that all sex differences are socially constructed, and that Western imperialism is the sole source of all third world problems. They are the postmodernists, pushing progressive activism at a college near you. They produce the mobs that violently shut down campus speakers, the language police who enshrine into law use of fabricated gender pronouns, and the deans whose livelihoods depend on madly rooting out discrimination where little or none exists. Their thinking took hold in Western universities in the 60s and 70s, when the true believers of the radical left became the professors of today. And now we rack up education-related debt, not so that our children learn to think critically, write clearly, or speak properly, but so they can model their mentor's destructive agenda. It's now possible to complete an English degree and never encounter Shakespeare, one of those dead white males whose works underlie our society of oppression. To understand and oppose the postmodernists, the ideas by which they orient themselves must be clearly identified. First is their new unholy trinity of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Diversity is defined not by opinion, but by race, ethnicity, or sexual identity. Equity is no longer the laudable goal of equality of opportunity, but the insistence on equality of outcome. And inclusion is the use of identity-based quotas to attain this misconceived state of equity. All the classic rights of the West are to be considered secondary to these new values. Take, for example, freedom of speech, the very pillar of democracy. The postmodernists refuse to believe that people of goodwill can exchange ideas and reach consensus. Their world is instead a Hobbesian nightmare of identity groups warring for power. They don't see ideas that run contrary to their ideology as simply incorrect. They see them as integral to the oppressive system they wish to supplant and consider it a moral obligation to stifle and constrain their expression. Second is rejection of the free market, of the very idea that free voluntary trading benefits everyone. They won't acknowledge that capitalism has lifted up hundreds of millions of people so they can, for the first time in history, afford food, shelter, clothing, transportation, even entertainment and travel. Those classified as poor in the U.S. and increasingly everywhere else are able to meet their basic needs. Meanwhile, in once prosperous Venezuela, until recently the poster child of the campus radicals, the middle class lines up for toilet paper. Third and finally are the politics of identity. Postmodernists don't believe in individuals. You're an exemplar of your race, sex, or sexual preference. You're also either a victim or an oppressor. No wrong can be done by anyone in the former group, and no good by the latter. Such ideas of victimization do nothing but justify the use of power and engender intergroup conflict. All these concepts originated with Karl Marx, the 19th century German philosopher. Marx viewed the world as a gigantic class struggle, the bourgeoisie against the proletariat, the grasping rich against the desperate poor. But wherever his ideas were put into practice, in the Soviet Union, China, Vietnam, and Cambodia, to name just a few, whole economies failed and tens of millions were killed. We fought a decades-long Cold War to stop the spread of those murderous notions, but they're back in the new guise of identity politics. 
The corrupt ideas of the postmodern neo-Marxists should be consigned to the dustbin of history. Instead, we underwrite their continuance in the very institutions where the central ideas of the West should be transmitted across the generations. Unless we stop, postmodernism will do to America and the entire Western world what it's already done to its universities. I'm Jordan Peterson, professor of psychology at the University of Toronto for Prager University. Maybe the dumbest thing you can do is go to the place that's supposed to make you smart. That would be college. Now, perhaps I'm biased. I don't have a college degree, although I employ a lot of people who do, and from some of the most prestigious universities in the country. I made a conscious choice. I had clear career ambitions, and I didn't see how a college degree was going to get me there. In retrospect, I'm confident I made the right decision. I'm the co-founder and co-CEO of a company called The Daily Wire. We publish news and commentary from a conservative point of view. We have well over 100 employees and an audience which numbers in the millions every single day. Now, I don't have a problem if you go to college. It's a free country. Do what you want. But the idea that somehow college is the great pathway to success and fulfillment, that I don't buy. The left takes a different view. They are obsessed with higher education. To them, it's a human right, and they want it to be free, which just means paid for by people like me, for anyone who's 18 and can breathe. That makes perfect sense from their point of view. One, the idea is a big winner among young people, a critical voting block. Who doesn't want something for nothing, especially something that costs more than a Ferrari? And two, colleges exist to do one thing, create conformity of thought. And since college professors and administrators overwhelmingly lean left, it's a pretty good bet most of their students will as well. But I'm being unfair, you say. After all, we live in a knowledge-based world, and America isn't making the grade. Don't you know we rank 13th in the world in reading, 18th in science literacy, and a pitiful 37th in math? To which I say, so what? It wasn't Singapore that split the atom, or Estonia that mapped the human genome. America is number one in Nobel Prizes awarded, number one in scientific citations issued, number one in popular entertainment, and number one in technological advancement. In short, America creates almost everything. Even what other countries manufacture was probably invented by an American, which is why we're also the number one economy in the world by far. And who made this possible? Well, here are the names of just a few of the individuals who pretty much invented the modern world. Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, Steve Jobs, Michael Dell, and Larry Ellison. None of them has a college degree. Many of the CEOs who run the companies they created do have college degrees, but the founders do not. What they do have are things colleges can't teach you. Curiosity, ambition, and a willingness to fail. Those qualities almost guarantee success. A college diploma doesn't. Want to build an airplane? Engineers educated in aerodynamics are handy to have on your team. Want to invent the airplane? Well, you're better off finding a couple of restless bicycle repairmen. That's what the Wright brothers were. It's not that colleges aren't teaching. It's that too often they're teaching the wrong things, or they're teaching the right things the wrong way. Tech entrepreneur David Galernter says, the thing I don't look for in a developer is a degree in computer science. Quite a statement from a man who teaches computer science at Yale. Tech billionaire and co-founder of PayPal, Peter Thiel, actually pays people not to go to college. Thiel and Galernter understand that colleges are factories, and like all factories, they want to produce a consistent product. That means producing people who all think alike. But innovation and entrepreneurship require people who think differently. Innovators innovate. Colleges teach those innovations, after the fact. If professors could have taught engineers how to build the airplane in 1903, professors would have built the airplane before 1903. They would have invented the personal computer, Microsoft, and social media, too. And it's not only big tech where this applies. 56% of all small business owners in the United States don't have a four-year degree. That's right. The majority of small business owners who employ more than half of American workers either never went to or never finished college. What all of this says to me is that while college is useful for some people, it's by no means necessary for all. 
and it's hardly essential for economic success, not for the individual and not for the nation. No one is being deprived of the opportunity to succeed simply because they can't afford a university's steep price tag. In fact, if you go to college, there's a good chance you'll be taught how not to succeed. If I were you, I'd think long and hard before paying for that. I'm Jeremy Boring for Prager University. Do you watch Fox News with your finger on the back button in case someone enters the room? Do you methodically clear your browser history to erase all evidence of PragerU videos? Do you hide your subscription to the Ben Shapiro podcast? Or, and perhaps most dangerous of all, are you afraid of getting caught watching The Rubin Report, which is hosted by the very scary but quite dapper Dave Rubin? If the answer to any of these questions is yes, then you're in the political closet and it's time to come out. Here's the good news. If you currently reside in the United States of America, you live in the freest country in the history of the world. Beyond some basic limitations, you can do whatever you want and, with hard work, become whatever it is you want to be. Pretty great, ain't it? So why the long face? Because you know that something is out of whack. You really don't feel free to say what you want or share your true thoughts on Facebook or even associate with those you'd like to. And why is that? I'll tell you why. Because there's a mass affliction spreading throughout the Western world. It's called the bravery deficit. People, good people like you, are afraid to say what they think. And there's little wonder. Believe that men can't give birth? Congrats, you're a transphobe. Want people to keep more of what they earn because they know how to spend it better than the government does? Bravo, you're a greedy capitalist. Understand that the gender pay gap is because men and women often choose different professions and different hours, not because of rampant sexism? Hooray, you're a misogynist. Take the wrong side of any hot button issue and your reputation, your friends, and your job can all be lost in an instant. You will likely never get a chance to confront your accusers, most of whom are anonymous. And you may feel forced to issue a faux apology to save yourself, which by the way, it usually won't. The understandable temptation is to think that this politically correct madness will soon end, just die out on its own. Well, it won't. Activists and their mainstream media allies like the New York Times and CNN, propaganda outlets like Media Matters and the Southern Poverty Law Center, and your local university will make sure of that. Big tech with its control of search algorithms, its shadow banning and deboosting are also in on the game. If you're one of the people who believes that if you just remain quiet, that things will get better, well, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but you're a frog in a slowly boiling pot, and it doesn't end well for the frog. So what can you do? Believe it or not, the solution is not that hard. Step one, think for yourself. Step two, say it out loud. Just because a former bartender says the world is gonna end in 12 years because of climate change doesn't mean it's true. Doomsdayers have been saying the same thing for decades and we're still here. Just because a filmmaker says we should model our healthcare system on Cuba's doesn't mean it's a good idea. Would you rather have heart surgery in Houston or in Havana? And just because a career politician is a millionaire with three houses who rails against the rich doesn't make him a hypocrite. Oh wait, in that case it actually does. The point is, perhaps your most important job as a human being is to stand up for the things you believe in. Don't take the path of least resistance. Be better than those who would silence you, deplatform you, and mob you. How? Just stop being afraid. The mob depends on the fact that everyone is scared to say what they think. Don't give them that power. All of the successes of America and the Western values that gave birth to America are being eroded as we speak. We can't just blame Hollywood, the media, and the political establishment any longer. It's time to look in the mirror. Think of the bravery of your grandparents and your ancestors before them who undoubtedly had it far worse than you do today. If they were brave, then you can be brave too. It's time to come out of the closet, the political one. You are the solution to the bravery deficit. So what are you waiting for? I'm Dave Rubin, author of Don't Burn This Book, Thinking for Yourself in an Age of Unreason for Prager University. According to folklore, Mahatma Gandhi was once asked what he thought of Western civilization. He replied that he thought it would be a good idea. 
This was supposed to be a joke, but forgive me for taking the other side. I think Western civilization was and is a good idea. This is the nearest thing to heresy that exists in modern academic life. At most universities in the English-speaking world, there are demands to decolonize the curriculum. As a result, fewer and fewer students now graduate with any understanding of what has differentiated the West from the rest of the world. They leave with the misleading view that the defining features of Western civilization are slavery, imperialism, and war. No one would deny that after they began to expand overseas in the late 1400s, the peoples of Western Europe engaged in all of those things. But the point is that these were the least original things they did. Prior to that time, nearly all major civilizations enslaved people, built empires, and made war. In many of the places that Europeans went, South America, Africa, the Middle East, South Asia, and East Asia, they encountered empires. The West first surged ahead of the rest thanks to a series of institutional innovations that I call the killer applications. One, economic and political competition. After the fall of the Roman Empire, Europe was politically fragmented into multiple monarchies and republics. These in turn were internally divided into competing corporate entities, among them the ancestors of modern business corporations. The Medici Bank in Renaissance Florence is a good example. Two, the scientific revolution. All the major 17th century breakthroughs in mathematics, astronomy, physics, chemistry, and biology happened in Western Europe. The difference with earlier advances in science was the realization that through experiment and measurement, nature could not only be understood, but manipulated and even mastered. Three, the rule of law and representative government. An optimal system of social and political order emerged in the English-speaking world based on private property rights and the representation of property owners in elected legislatures. This was quite different from the systems of law that had evolved elsewhere, in which individual rights were given short shrift. 4. Modern medicine. Nearly all the major 19th and 20th century breakthroughs in healthcare were made by West Europeans and North Americans. Ironically, it was European researchers working in colonies who found cures for some of the most lethal tropical diseases, such as yellow fever. 5. The Consumer Society The Industrial Revolution took place where there was both a supply of productivity-enhancing technologies and a demand for more, better, and cheaper goods. Without elastic demand for manufactured cloth, for example, there would have been little point in driving down its price. 6. The work ethic. Westerners worked longer, worked harder, and saved more of what they earned. This led to unprecedented capital accumulation, which in turn led to investment in the wonders of modern technology. For hundreds of years, these killer apps were essentially monopolized by West Europeans and their cousins who settled in North America and Australasia. They are the best explanation for what economic historians call the Great Divergence, the astonishing gap that arose between Western standards of living and those in the rest of the world. Yes, Western civilization did empire. It did war. It did slavery. But these weren't the things that led to the Great Divergence and the period of Western dominance of the world. It was the six killer applications that were crucial. And this Western bundle of institutions still seems to offer humanity the best hope of solving the problems we face in the 21st century. Maybe the biggest of these problems is not the rise of China, radical Islam, or carbon dioxide emissions, but our own loss of faith in the civilization we inherited from our ancestors. Winston Churchill was no friend of Gandhi. In 1938, Churchill defined the central principle of Western civilization as the subordination of the ruling class to the people and to their will as expressed in a constitution. Maybe you know of another civilization that came up with that simple but uniquely powerful idea. I don't. 
I'm Neil Ferguson, fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford for Prager University. The promoters of identity politics, the idea that we are primarily defined by our race and gender, have taken over the humanities and social sciences. That's bad, but not as bad as this. They are moving in on STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. All across the country, a UCLA scientist reports, the big question is, how can we promote more women and minorities by changing, i.e. lowering, the requirements we had previously set for graduate level study? The National Science Foundation, NSF, a federal agency that funds university research, exemplifies this approach. Progress in science, the NSF argues, requires a diverse STEM workforce. Why this is the case, they don't bother to say. Somehow, NSF-backed scientists managed to rack up more than 200 Nobel Prizes before the agency realized that scientific progress depends on diversity. No matter, in July 2017, it awarded $1 million to the University of New Hampshire and two other institutions to develop a bias awareness intervention tool. Another $2 million went to the Department of Aerospace Engineering at Texas A&M to remediate microaggressions and implicit biases. The science diversity charade, as I discuss in my book, The Diversity Delusion, wastes extraordinary amounts of time and money that could be going into basic research and its real-world application. If that were its only consequence, the cost would be high enough. But identity politics is altering the standards for scientific competence and the way future scientists are trained. Diversity is now an explicit job qualification in the STEM fields. The physics department at UC San Diego advertised an assistant professor position with a specific emphasis on contributions to diversity, such as a candidate's awareness of inequities faced by underrepresented groups. Solving the mystery of dark energy apparently now takes a back seat to social justice. Maybe it was a coincidence, but all five candidates on UC San Diego's shortlist were females. If traditional standards are keeping women and minorities out of STEM fields, it stands to reason that changing standards must be the way to get them in. Or maybe standards are just another expression of the white patriarchy and thus no longer relevant. An introductory chemistry course at UC Berkeley reflects the new culturally sensitive pedagogy. A primary goal, according to its teachers, is to disrupt the racialized and gendered construct of scientific brilliance, which defines good science as getting all the right answers. This same diversity obsession extends to medical schools, not a happy thought when they wheel you into the operating room for emergency surgery. The promoters of identity politics are literally playing with our lives. Medical schools' admissions committees are now told to overlook the low test scores of black and Hispanic applicants in favor of a more holistic approach. From 2013 to 2016, medical schools admitted 57% of black applicants with a low medical college admission test score of 24 to 26, but only 8% of whites and 6% of Asians with those same low scores, according to Claremont McKenna professor Frederick Lynch. Racial preferences in med school programs are sometimes justified on the basis that minorities want doctors who look like them. Really? Seems much more likely that minority patients with serious illnesses want the same thing we all do, a well-trained, skilled doctor. The desperate attempt to get women into STEM fields is also based on the idea that, absent discrimination, women and men would be equally represented in the sciences. This is highly unlikely, however. Differences in math proficiency between boys and girls show up as early as kindergarten, in the top 0.01% of math ability, where we find scientific genius. There are 2.5 males in the U.S. for every female, according to a recent paper in the journal Intelligence. This may help explain why women make up 14% of engineering workers and 25% of computer workers. To acknowledge this was once common sense, now it can get you fired. Ask James Damore, the Google engineer who questioned the company's hiring preferences for females. The National Labor Relations Board upheld Google's firing of Damore on the grounds that his statements about 
purported biological differences between men and women were discriminatory and constituted sexual harassment. This decision means that every evolutionary biologist, neurologist, or economist who acknowledges the differences between males and females is at risk of his job. The unique accomplishments of Western science were achieved without regard to the sex or skin color of its creators. Now, however, funders, industry leaders, and academic administrators want us to believe that diversity is the key to the future. But the truth is the exact opposite. We want our best scientific minds to be free to do their best work. In our highly competitive world, identity politics is an indulgence we can't afford. I'm Heather McDonald, fellow at the Manhattan Institute for Prager University. How important is free speech on a college campus? Here's what the Supreme Court said in 1957 in the landmark case Sweezy v. New Hampshire. Teachers and students must always remain free to inquire, otherwise our civilization will stagnate and die. Inspiring words and true. Which is why what's happening in American colleges and universities is so disturbing. A study conducted by the Association of American Colleges and Universities in 2010 revealed that only 30% of college seniors strongly agreed with the question, is it safe to hold unpopular positions on this campus? Worse, the study found that students' confidence that they can hold unpopular opinions declines from freshman to senior year. How can it be that at a place where speech should be the most free, the university, Young people fear merely holding to say nothing of actually expressing unpopular opinions. The reason is that for decades now, students have been sent a clear message from their schools. Express dissenting opinions, violate political correctness, or even just criticize the administration at your peril. After working for 12 years at the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, I have seen hundreds of examples of students in peril. Here are just a few. At Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis, a student employee was found guilty of racial harassment for publicly reading a book that some of his fellow employees found offensive. The book was Notre Dame versus the Klan, and it was available in the school's library. It recounted and celebrated the defeat of the Ku Klux Klan when its members marched on Notre Dame in 1924. So what did the university find offensive? The photo on the book's cover. At the University of Delaware, students were forced to undergo ideological re-education as part of the university's compulsory student orientation program. The program was described as treatment for students with incorrect attitudes and beliefs. Students were taught to adopt highly specific university-approved views on politics, race, sexuality, sociology, moral philosophy, and environmentalism. They were also required to attend one-on-one -on -one meetings with their resident assistants where they were compelled to answer intrusive, probing, and utterly irrelevant personal questions such as, when did you discover your sexual identity? And an increasing number of schools are trying to drive religious students off campus. Vanderbilt University, for example, has enacted a policy that forbids faith-based student groups from selecting members and leaders based on their faith. As a result, 14 Christian groups have been de-recognized by the university. Then there are speech codes at a majority of American colleges and universities. What is a speech code? It is a university regulation or policy that limits or bans expression, written or verbal, that is protected under the First Amendment. Such codes are applied with glaring double standards against religious, conservative, or politically incorrect speech, or simply speech that a particular campus administration happens to dislike. In other words, there are things you are completely free to say and write off campus that will get you in serious trouble if you say or write them on campus. These codes include policies that ban speech that administrators find insulting or offensive. One absurd code that appeared at multiple universities banned inappropriately directed laughter. And in Orwellian fashion, some schools even limit free speech to tiny sections of campus called free speech zones. Recently, at the University of Central Arkansas, you were subject to disciplinary action if you said or did something deemed annoying to another student. In the most extensive study yet conducted of campus speech codes, the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education found that 62% of America's top colleges maintain serious restrictions on written and verbal expression that violate First Amendment protections. What are the consequences of all this censorship by colleges and universities? 
I explain that in detail in my book, Unlearning Liberty, Campus Censorship and the End of American Debate. But for our purposes here, I will focus on just three. First, campus censorship teaches students that they have a right not to be offended. The moment society says that people have the right not to be offended, it is announced the end of the right to free speech. Second, campus censorship teaches students poor intellectual habits. It teaches them not to think critically lest they arrive at a conclusion or express a thought that might offend someone. Further, students are taught to ignore the timeless principle that educated people should actively seek out intelligent people with whom they disagree for debate and discussion. And third, it teaches students that they have fewer rights than they actually have, that they must defer to arbitrary authority. A generation of students who don't know their rights and believe they must get permission before speaking their minds is not thinking like a free people, and that is a threat to a free society. The rights embodied in the First Amendment shape American society. They foster America's religious and cultural pluralism, spur scientific and scholarly innovation, and thus secure our remarkable prosperity. But today's universities, with their censorship, speech codes, and political correctness, are putting the future of this unique experiment in freedom at risk. This is the very opposite of what American higher education was founded to do. I'm Greg Lukianoff, president of the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education for Prager University. Is higher education politically liberal? The answer is clearly yes. In virtually every field within academia, the great majority of professors identify strongly with both leftist causes and the Democratic Party. Renowned sociologist Seymour Lipset was one of the first to examine this question. Based on a number of surveys taken since World War II, Lipset concluded that academics were more likely than any other occupational group to identify their views as left or liberal. Professors tend to support a wide variety of egalitarian social and economic policies. They're far more likely to vote for Democratic candidates, and in many cases back leftist third parties. While Lipset based his conclusions on faculty surveys from the 1950s through the early 1980s, more recent studies show that the professoriate's commitment to leftist politics has only strengthened. In our book, The Still Divided Academy, my colleagues April Kelly Westner, the late Stanley Rothman, and I take an in-depth look at faculty views at the beginning of this century. Consistent with earlier studies, we find that a mere 12% of professors see themselves as Republicans. But even this statistic is deceiving. Among the small minority of faculty who call themselves Republicans, 51% are pro-choice. 63% support more environmental regulations, even though it could cost people their jobs. And 39% of Republicans believe that the government should work to reduce the income gap between the rich and the poor. So not only are there relatively few Republicans in the ranks of the faculty, but many of the Republican professors hold views that are identical to Democrats outside of academia. Based on the best evidence, fewer than one in 10 professors hold conservative social, political, moral, or economic views. Although college professors are overwhelmingly on the left, there are big differences in the political values of faculty depending on their field. Dan Klein, a professor of economics at George Mason University and his colleagues, conducted an in-depth study of six academic disciplines, anthropology, economics, history, philosophy, political science, and sociology. Within these fields, faculty back the Democratic candidate over Republican candidates by a ratio of 15 to 1. The left's advantage was most lopsided in anthropology and sociology, where Democratic faculty voters outnumbered Republican voters by approximately 30 to 1. In political science, faculty support for the Democrats over Republicans runs only 7 to 1. And in economics, the ratio is a mere 3 to 1. On the surface, then, it certainly appears that the odds are stacked against college students receiving anything but a left-wing indoctrination. But the picture is not so grim as it might first appear. In the battle for ideas, conservative professors don't need to be equally represented in a discipline to have an impact on the students they teach. Whereas sociology or philosophy students may never hear a conservative perspective, most economics and political science departments have at least one, and often more than one Republican on the roster. Even in leftist academia, there are islands of non-leftist thought, provided students who do not want to receive only one view of the world know where to look. Given academia's overwhelmingly left-wing bias, what effect does this have on the students' thinking? The evidence is somewhat surprising. According to my research, students who enter conservative tend to remain conservative, and students who enter liberal tend to remain liberal. Conservative students, if they look for conservative professors, can often find some. 
and liberal students can easily go through four or more years at the university having never heard a conservative idea. Ironically, therefore, it's not conservative students who suffer as a result of this overwhelmingly liberal bias, but liberal students. They rarely, if ever, have their views challenged. And if the point of college is to expose students to diverse worldviews, then college experience for liberal students is sadly lacking. And what about students who enter college without any formed ideology? They're also shortchanged by higher education's liberal bias. These students are pushed toward a left-leaning worldview in large part because that's the only perspective they've ever been offered. Ideally, higher education should be about expanding students' minds by subjecting them to new ideas and testing their assumptions. That's exactly what most conservative students experience, and that's exactly what most liberal students don't. And that's a shame. I'm Matthew Wessner, Associate Professor of Political Science at Penn State University Harrisburg for Prager University. What kind of future do we have if we destroy our past? Has anyone who has pulled down a statue of Churchill, Lincoln, or Columbus thought to ask themselves this question? I doubt it. The presumption that we can stand in perfect judgment over the lives of historical figures is not merely foolish and unfair, it's dangerous. Consider what the statue destroyers are in effect saying. They are saying that people in history should have known what we know. That's tantamount to saying they should have known the future. This is, of course, absurd. Yet more and more people believe it. Why? Simple. It's what they're taught. It is the fruit of an education system that long ago prioritised empathy over facts, that believes the ultimate point of history is not to learn lessons from it, but to judge it from the preordained left-wing conclusions about such ill-defined concepts as social justice, equity and tolerance. Apart from breeding ignorance, this kind of education invites the student, the child really, to be judge, jury and executioner over issues that they, and increasingly their teachers, know little or nothing about. Because no one has bothered to teach them the nuance, complexity and context that is history. It also breeds arrogance. I know things these people did not know, therefore I am better than they were, they have nothing to teach me, in fact I must teach them, and down comes the statue. A new, better history must take the place of the old one. In America, this impulse has culminated in the 1619 Project, an initiative started by the New York Times and now in schools everywhere, which attempts to make the arrival of the first African slaves into the American colonies the foundational date of the American Republic. 1776, the American Revolution? In the new history, that was just about protecting the founders' slave interests. These men, some of the most remarkable humans to have lived at any time, are to be understood simply by their attitude towards this one issue. The 1619 Project seeks to portray America, the freest, most prosperous nation in world history, as exceptional only in one respect, insofar as being exceptionally bad. This is a purposefully destructive view of history. It is one intended to pull down rather than to build up. A healthy, humane and in the truest sense liberal mind does not view history as a mere playpen for our moral judgment. It recognises that people in the past acted on the information they had just as we do today. Sure, it would have been nice if the founders of America had abolished slavery in its constitution. Some, in fact, tried very hard to do so. But had they been unwilling to compromise, there would be no constitution and no United States. All the sacrifices of the revolution would have been lost. So a compromise balancing the interests of the northern states and the southern states was reached. It would have been nice if the Japanese had surrendered before atom bombs were dropped over Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but they didn't. President Truman had to make his decision based on the information he had at the time, that an Allied invasion of the Japanese home island would cost at least a million lives, both American and Japanese. Of course, the woke mind abhors these subtleties. It knows that it is right and that everybody before our current age, year zero, should have known better. Anyway, they were all bigots, 
Why should we give them any benefit of the doubt, let alone admire them or learn from them? Well, maybe because, like everyone else, the great figures of the past did the best they could under the circumstances in which they found themselves. That their efforts largely succeeded is why we are here. When someone tried to give Sir Isaac Newton credit for his world-changing discoveries in physics, the great man demurred. He said he was only able to achieve what he did by standing on the shoulders of the giants who went before him. Today's left rejects Newton's humility. It doesn't believe that we stand on anyone's shoulders. It imagines that if we could only liberate ourselves from the dusty, misguided, and misinformed ideas of the past, then we might see further, fly still higher. This view is wrong. Divorced from our past, we would be utterly lost. We would not rise, but plummet. We would be forced to start again with far less insight and with far poorer examples as our guides. Ironically, thanks to the statue destroyers, the great figures of the past have never looked greater. I'm Douglas Murray, author of The Madness of Crowds, for Prager University. It's appalling that, in the 21st century, there is still so little diversity on American college campuses. This cannot stand. It's not who we are. It's intolerable. It's time we demand a change. It's time to stage a protest, to storm the dean's office. We will not be ignored. Diversity is our strength. I'm not talking about diversity of skin color. Been there, done that. Today's campuses are more racially integrated than at any time in history. And I'm not talking about gender diversity. Women already make up the majority of college graduates. And if your concern is non-binary gender, there is no place on earth more accepting of hims, hers, zims, and zers than a college campus. I'm not even talking about sexual diversity. You can pretty much experiment with anyone you want, in any way you want, as long as you get a consent form signed and notarized in advance. No, the diversity I'm talking about is diversity of thought. Let me say it again in case you missed it. Diversity of thought. That's right. People expressing different points of view on an issue. At most colleges today, that's a dangerous, revolutionary idea if that different point of view is not on the left. The moment you enter college, you enter an indoctrination center. Remember orientation week? It starts there and never stops. They tell you to be open-minded, but they don't really mean it. Almost all your professors are on the left, nearly 12 to 1, left to right, according to a recent study by Econo Journal Watch. There are many departments at many colleges that don't have a single conservative voice. The administration invariably supports leftist positions. And all those diversity administrators, they depend for their livelihood, that means their paycheck, on creating victims. Diversity of race or gender or sexuality or any of the other distinctions du jour that universities glorify are, at best, superficial, and at worst, just plain destructive. It's destructive to any real learning. If you don't study Shakespeare because he was a white male, hmm. you have been deprived of learning from the most brilliant playwright who ever lived. And it's destructive of a peaceful campus environment because it pits racial, ethnic, and gender groups against one another. In other words, diversity, as practiced on your typical college campus, divides, not unites people. And diversity of thought, the free exchange of ideas, you know, what college is actually supposed to be about, not happening. If you've been in college for a few years, ask yourself this. When was the last time you heard a professor or a TA make the argument that capitalism has lifted more people out of poverty than any other economic system? or that socialism always leads to poverty, or that the post-World War II order created by America has been the freest and most prosperous time in human history, or that the cause of high crime rates in black communities has very little to do with historic racism. And God forbid if a conservative speaker should show up on campus and dare say any of these things. If the ideas of the people on the right have so little merit, why bother to protest? 
Shouldn't their bad ideas just die on their own? Isn't the purpose of a liberal education to expose students to differing points of view? Turns out that the liberal in liberal education means leftist. Here's how the University of California at Berkeley, the pinnacle of political correctness, describes itself. Our goal is to transform UC Berkeley into an equitable and inclusive academy of the highest caliber, one that fully honors the diversity of our students, faculty, and staff. Give me a break. Berkeley needs to be transformed. It's not diverse enough. After all these years of expanding equity and inclusion, bull crap. It positively reeks of sexist heteropatriarchy. Say that three times. I don't know what it means, but it sure sounds bad. Walk around the Berkeley campus, or almost any campus, and you'll see plenty of blacks, Hispanics, gays, lesbians, even a straight white guy or two. College is a place where they want everyone to look different, but think exactly the same. It's like a freaking cult. At some point, you have to stand up, separate yourself from the crowd, and say, enough. It's time to diversify thought on campus. It's time to demand a real education. God knows you're paying for it. I'm Charlie Kirk, president of Turning Point USA for Prager University. Have you ever heard the old saying that a conservative is just a liberal who got mugged? Well, I got mugged to the tune of $60,000 a year. It's called tuition. Like everyone who cons themselves into attending a liberal arts college, I was captivated by the idea of changing the world. I would immerse myself in a diverse pool of academic thought, theory, and action. Well, it didn't quite work out that way. Over the course of four years, I was transformed from a plucky, free-thinking, free spirit into a cranky, get-off-my-lawn conservative. The process started not long after I arrived at my elite East Coast school. I thought I was there to expand my knowledge of the world, to debate the great ideas. I soon realized, however, that my professors had something else in mind. Invariably, each class followed the same monotonous ritual. Identify a problem, say racism, blow it up beyond all proportion, blame the problem on the white majority culture, and then offer an unworkable solution, usually involving the government. Everywhere I turned, I saw political correctness. At first, I just rolled with it. Then I got annoyed. Then it started to tick me off. I was being brainwashed, indoctrinated, and I was paying for the privilege with borrowed money. Almost every speaker who came to campus was a leftist journalist, a leftist activist, or a leftist professor from another leftist school. The ones who weren't leftists were just weird. One time, I attended a film lecture given by a very skilled paraplegic adult film star who showed us some of her art. Another time, I went to a performance given by a woman who engaged in auto-eroticism behind a curtain. I couldn't deal with it. The PC culture, the mono-thinking, the weirdness. I needed some way to cope. So I got high almost every day. Parenthetically, most of the worst stoners I knew are now working in finance or politics. In fact, this is what made me first realize that I was a fan of limited government. I do not trust these goofs to make policy. Their power must be constrained. This brings me to another black hole in the college experience. Useless majors, the only thing more pervasive than marijuana and irresponsible future leaders. I'm not being judgmental here. I have a degree in film and media studies and political science. Why did I choose them? They're subjects I like talking about. Practical, right? But I wasn't alone. Most of my peers also chose to spend their student loan money on subjects better learned on YouTube or Turner Classic Movies. By the time graduation approached, none of us had developed any actual job skills. And people want to raise taxes to pay for free college for everyone? <laughs> Are you kidding me? No, just no. I'd only give a free education to a smart kid who promised to get a degree in whatever the exact opposite of my degree is. And that degree didn't come cheap. I took on tens of thousands of dollars of debt, but never spent a minute learning how to manage it. No such classes were even offered. I might have actually learned something useful if they had been. I didn't learn about taxes either, other than that the rich should pay their fair share. 
It was only after college, when I was lucky enough to get my first job, that I discovered the truth. The government takes away a lot of your money. Frankly, it's shocking. And that's not even counting the mandatory $400 a month deduction for my student loans. I'll probably have that albatross around my neck for the rest of my life. Really, I can't believe my peers and I spent so much time shaming conservatives for wanting to lower taxes. A past version of myself would call this desire to keep what I earn selfish. The current, cheerfully realistic version of me knows this. I can spend my money much better than the politically correct stoners who are running the government can. So, I guess, in a roundabout way, I did get something of value out of my expensive liberal arts education after all. Common sense. I'm Jay Stevens for Prager University. You are looking at a dangerous person. You may feel unsafe, even threatened by my very existence. What is this power I possess? It's called free speech. While I knew it was always there, I recently discovered its true value. Here's my story. It could easily be yours. I'm a journalist, an author, and a podcaster. I live in Portland, Oregon. My husband owns a few local coffee shops and a small coffee roasting business called Ristretto Roasters. In December 2018, I started a YouTube podcast entitled Hashtag Me Neither. The show's about page reads, Me Neither is an almost weekly conversation about the cultural issues of the day and an attempt to create a space where people can find ways to think out loud through uncomfortable topics. One of those topics is the Me Too movement and what I see as some of its excesses, including celebrities who exploit Me Too for personal gain. Sexual assault and harassment are real, but the idea that any charge any woman or man brings must be believed without question? Where's the logic in that? I believe we are better off judging any claim of harassment like any other claim, on its own merits. This, I would learn, is not a popular position. It turned out one of the people tuning into my new show was a former employee of my husband's coffee business. She claimed my views were vile, dangerous, and extremely misguided, and in an email to the press, claimed my opinions created a demoralizing and hostile environment for employees. Why would the opinions of the wife of the boss demoralize an employee? No one bothered to ask that question. That I appeared to be on the wrong side of the Me Too debate was all people needed to know. By the time you could say Twitter, a social media mob formed to say they would never spend another penny at my husband's business. A college-age girl stormed into one of the cafes, screaming variously that the baristas were in danger and that their working at the cafe posed a threat to the community. Employees previously secure in their jobs grew jittery and quit. One suggested that my husband sell the company and that I offer a public apology before it was too late. This all happened within the first 48 hours. As the outrage grew, local businesses that make up a big part of my husband's base cut and run. Wholesale customers canceled large accounts, afraid they'd be caught in the Me Too crossfire. Staff now worried that they'd lose their jobs and health insurance if Ristretto were forced to close, that I, a person with whom they'd heretofore had a perfectly congenial relationship might, in fact, be a secret monster, a rape culture apologist. Many of those who claimed to have been offended had not seen the podcast. One woman wrote, I clicked, downvoted, then reported on YouTube that it violates community guidelines. Hateful. I didn't listen, but it's one way to make that expletive go away. This kind of uninformed virtual attack strikes me as childish. The behavior of a toddler whose tantrum brings a dinner party to a halt until it's placated with the attention it seeks. I invited my critics to speak with me. The whole point of me neither is to provoke discussion. No one took me up on my offer. It was evidently easier for so-called feminists to tell my husband to leave his wife or lose his business, for some random dude on Facebook to send me the message, you are scum, rotten hell you dirty, just use your imagination than to honestly confront me. I can't help but think that those who engage in this kind of behavior are steering themselves into perpetually unhappy waters, that they live in fear that everyone and everything is out to get them, so therefore they must strike first. Or are they addicted to the feeling that what they are doing is righteous? Not considering intolerance in the name of tolerance is a frightening contradiction and solves nothing. Or maybe they think they are making progress. But if this is progress, one might reasonably ask, for whom and to what end? 
It's also contrary to what is most fundamental to America, that every citizen has the equal right to voice his or her opinion and to express these opinions in a public forum. My story is one of many, another cautionary tale for those who get pulled into the culture wars. I understand why most people want to stay out of it. It's scary to fight for liberty and against a mob. The whole thing is exhausting. I've repeatedly been asked, usually in you should have known better tones, if I'm going to stop having nuanced conversations about sensitive subjects. The answer is absolutely not. And if that makes you feel unsafe, too bad. I'm Nancy Rommelman, journalist and author for Prager University.